Today is Saturday, July 30th. Today, we want to give you a break from the heavier headlines and talk about something fun, entertainment, specifically video streaming services. There are so many of them now, it can be tough to keep up with all of the options. So we start with an expert's take on the current state of the so-called streaming wars and which subscriptions really deserve your dollars. Our first guest is Jordan Miner from the tech magazine PC Mag. He leads their coverage on video streaming, and he's written reviews on many of them. He's here to share his thoughts on each of the top platforms to help you compare, and he has a controversial tip for sampling them all while still saving money. Welcome, welcome to the Newsworthy Special Edition Saturday, when we sit down with a different expert or celebrity every Saturday to talk about something in the news. Don't forget to tune in every Monday through Friday for our regular episodes, where we provide all the day's news in 10 minutes. I'm Erica Mandy. It's now time for today's Special Edition Saturday. Hi, Jordan. Thank you so much for coming on the Newsworthy. Hi. uh, Yeah, happy to be here. First, what's your take on the state of video streaming services today? When streaming kind of first started, it was seen as a pretty, you know, it was a, it was a simpler, more convenient alternative to having to pay for all these confusing cable bundles. But now there are so many different streaming services that it's basically become as confusing and as expensive if you want to keep up with all of them. Let's do a lightning round of sorts where we get your brief take on each of the main streaming platforms. So you can tell us pros or cons or maybe who this platform would be best for, anything that you think is important to know about this platform. Does that sound good? Sounds good. Okay, cool. So let's do the biggest one first, Netflix. Uh, Netflix used to be the one for everything, uh, but everyone else wanted to be Netflix, so they took their shows off Netflix and made their own things. Um, Netflix is throwing a ton of money towards stuff like Stranger Things and you know these big prestige shows that aren't quite doing it for them like it used to. They're losing, uh, losing subscribers. But for me personally, uh, Netflix is best at this point. It's kind of sad, but they're best for really trashy, cheap reality dating shows like Love is Blind or The Ultimatum. They're on the decline, but they were starting from such a high place that even Netflix on the decline is still pretty appealing. What about Disney Plus? And do you think it will eventually overtake Netflix? Disney Plus has stuff, you know, they have all this Marvel stuff, they have Star Wars, they have all these classic characters and franchises that you can't really compete with um, if you care about those things. I think the big move for them potentially, though, is they, is their bundle stuff. You can get Disney Plus and Hulu and ESPN Plus. Overseas, Hulu and Disney Plus are, are more bundled together. Uh, but we're starting to see now Disney Plus getting more uh, lax with allowing R-rated stuff onto the service. If Disney, like integrates the more adult stuff of Hulu into Disney Plus, that could be a very appealing service, I think. What about Apple TV Plus? They have a lot of really high quality stuff. Uh, People love Severance. Uh, They love Ted Lasso. I think Mythic Quest is a pretty good show. They just, their movie won uh, Best Picture this year, the Oscars, Coda. I still think right now they're just a little bit light on stuff. And I could just see just something about these tech companies. I could see them getting like bored and distracted and not putting as much support into it as like a dedicated kind of movie studio might. But there's potential there for sure. What about Amazon Prime Video? They're good in for being able to not just like stream stuff, but like kind of rent and purchase stuff sort of a la carte. Um, and they have good originals. Mrs. Maisel is good. People love The Boys. Uh, that's been a big hit for them recently. And if you're just already in Amazon's ecosystem for all sorts of commerce you do, you know, from, from Kindle and all the products you can buy from Amazon, you might as well also be streaming. HBO Max. Uh, I'm very partial to HBO Max. The prestige show model is really pioneered by HBO Max or HBO. And obviously you get all that on HBO Max. You also have just, you know, Warner Discovery has a very diverse catalog of properties between like, you know, the DC stuff and Cartoon Network and Adult Swim and just the movies that they get on HBO, you know, even stuff their own movies, just the kind of movie quality they're able to attract on HBO pretty soon after theaters. So I'm, I'm very into HBO Max. What about Showtime? Uh, Showtime is good when you consider it also a part of the Paramount Plus stuff. That all together, I think is a pretty good package. So you get Star Trek, Nickelodeon is included in all that. So that's another, that, that one's also kind of slept on uh, for me. Is overall the Paramount, Showtime, Viacom, CBS umbrella. YouTube TV. YouTube Premium is a subscription. You pay like $12 a month and you get YouTube without ads and, you know, some YouTube originals, which are not very good. Um, and YouTube Music, which is a cool music streaming service. But YouTube TV is a live TV service 
which, you know, as opposed to streaming services, live TV lets you watch like live network TV channels uh, closer to a traditional cable service or something. The downside is that it's, those are very expensive. YouTube TV is like $65 a month. What do you think I'm missing? Are there any others that, that should get mentioned here? Peacock is a favorite among uh, for, our, for us. Um, it has a very generous free tier. They had earlier this year a gritty reboot of The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air that I found pretty funny. Uh, they have The Office. So that's another pretty good one. What is the deal with all the other smaller ones that we see when we're looking at all the different apps like Tubi, for example, or other free ones that are out there? Should we be considering any of these? And, and what's their deal? Their deal is that they're trying to appeal to very uh, enthusiastic niches. So people who don't want to pay anything at all. There are some very good horror-specific streaming services like Shudder. Uh, we've covered a lot of anime streaming services. So like Crunchyroll, well, now basically just, just Crunchyroll. Um, there's sites like Curiosity Stream for like documentaries. Uh, so yeah, so once you kind of get out of this mainstream realm, you're really starting to get into very specialized services. At the end of the day, what's your advice for people when they're trying to decide which platforms to pay for and how many to pay for? Uh, so this is not what the services want you to hear, but I'm very much in favor of if you only want to watch one thing, just subscribe for the month to watch that thing. And then if there's something else you want, then then stay. But don't don't feel the need to describe longer than you have to. If you are proactive about that, then you can really sample everything that's out there without having to pay too much. Do you think it's still a better option than cable because at least it's all on demand? I think so, because also, you know, your your big bill is the streaming, but also the Internet and you need the Internet um, and just the convenience to be able to watch whatever you want, whatever, to me, at least, um, is a very big deal. Where do you think streaming platforms are going next? And do you think virtual reality is going to play a part in all of this in the near future? I do not think that virtual reality will ever become mainstream enough to matter. I think it's too isolating. You even see now Facebook is raising the price of one of their headsets, uh, which is pretty buck wild to me. But as far as the streaming stuff, we're just in an interesting kind of inflection point right now of we're coming off of Netflix being so dominant because there was no competition. Um, and now them on the decline and we're you know, all these other competitors rising up and everything's everything's still sort of still shaking out. Um, I still don't think we've quite reached like the equilibrium where we can say, OK, this is the landscape. This is the status quo. These are the major players. Um, we're maybe almost there, but I feel like we're not quite there. Anything else you want to add or just a final thought? I still also just love going to movie theaters. So um, as much as this stuff is really convenient and it's cool to get stuff um, in a pretty convenient streaming form, I just hope that this doesn't leave us at a point where the only movies that matter are like the big super blockbusters. You know, I think it's just healthy for all sorts of different entertainment to exist. I don't I don't want people to talk about this future where the only entertainment is like big superhero movies and theaters and like eight episode streaming shows for adults. And I think that's a kind of depressing future. People should in general um, sample all sorts of different media in all sorts of different forms. Still ahead, we're talking more about the future and business side of streaming with entertainment industry lawyer and former Marvel Studios attorney Paul Sarker. He gives his insider take on whether cable TV still has a place, what's next for where you'll be watching live sports, the role of movie theaters in the age of streaming, and more. But first, let's take a quick break to thank our sponsors. Have you ever needed to see a doctor, but the one you usually go to, or really the one your friend recommended, is booked up for weeks or even months? Maybe that recommendation for the doctor your coworker gave you is not even taking new patients at all, or that office doesn't take your insurance. I know I've experienced all of the above. Finding a new doctor can feel like such a time-consuming hassle. But ZocDoc helps solve all of those problems. ZocDoc is a free app that shows you doctors who are patient-reviewed, take your insurance, and are available when you need them. And ZocDoc's mobile app lets you quickly search, find, and book doctors with a few taps. And I'm talking about doctors that are in-network, in your neighborhood, and available ASAP. You can also read verified patient reviews. Simply go to ZocDoc.com, find the doctor that is right for you, and book an appointment in person or remotely, whatever works for your schedule. Go to ZocDoc.com newsworthy and download the ZocDoc app for free. Then start your search for a top-rated doctor today. Many are available within 24 hours. That's Z-O-C-D-O-C dot com slash newsworthy, ZocDoc.com slash newsworthy. Today's podcast is also brought to you by Indeed. We here at The Newsworthy like to be your go-to place for news where you can get a wide variety of stories all in one place and quickly. 
Well, Indeed is the hiring platform where you can attract, interview, and hire all in one place and quickly. Yep, when you need to hire great people fast, you need Indeed. They have time-saving tools like Indeed Instant Match, assessments, and virtual interviews. And in business, the people you find and hire make all the difference. It's clear Indeed is doing something right as a hiring partner because Indeed delivers four times more hires than all other job sites combined, according to data from Talent Nest in 2019. In fact, in the minute I'm talking about this with you, Indeed data worldwide shows 16 hires will be made on Indeed. And Indeed is doing something no other job site has done. Now with Indeed, businesses only pay for quality applications matching the sponsored job description. Visit indeed.com slash newsworthy to start hiring now. Just go to indeed.com slash newsworthy. Indeed.com slash newsworthy. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Okay, now to my conversation with Paul Sarker. Hi, Paul. Thank you for coming on the Newsworthy. Thank you for having me. So I first want to ask you about what the CEO of Netflix actually said recently, and that is that streaming services are doing so well that linear TV will be dead in five to 10 years. Do you agree with that? There's a scenario where I wouldn't be surprised if linear TV continues to decline. I mean, let's be clear, it's been declining since the mid 2000s. It's a trend that no one can deny, but I think there's still people that watch news and live sports, and that's a part of linear television. I think it's evolving. I don't think it's particularly growing. But I don't know if it'll be dead in five years. Yeah, it seems streaming services are really trying to get more on board with live sports. Do you see that trend continuing? And what is that going to take? Like, what are the deals that have to go on for that to happen? What would have to happen? Here's Let's take an example. So NFL recently announced Roger Goodell was at Sun Valley in Idaho. And he said that he thinks he wouldn't be surprised if NFL Sunday Ticket went to a streaming partner in the next deal cycle. So... NFL Sunday Ticket was exclusive to DirecTV probably from the mid-90s on, and DirecTV paid a premium for that exclusivity. Now that DirecTV is no longer the highest bidder for those rights, and what Roger Goodell said was Apple, Disney, and Amazon are now bidding for those rights. Do you think that sports is one of the main focuses right now because everybody's already making series and movies on their own, but that's kind of the last thing that's really holding up linear TV. The things that are holding together the bundle are sports and news. The, the other thing I'd mention, though, is like what linear television is and what the cable bundle was 20 years ago could resurface, right? If you start to see this proliferation of streaming services where there's like 25 streaming services right. and they all have slightly different things and different price points. And I, as you see, Disney's doing this where, you know, if you get Hulu and Disney Plus and ESPN Plus, you get a a slightly cheaper package. Sometimes they're bundling it with like cell phone in the case of HBO Max and AT&T. Yeah, that's my next question is have streaming channels just become the new cable? We pay for so many of them now and that there's going to be more and more choices, I'm guessing. Right. I mean, so it's, it's interesting how the pendulum kind of swings back. When Netflix first started, they had maybe a decade of competition free dominance. Now, People start to realize the market's getting crowded. And another thing that could be happening is someone may get together and say, pick any seven streaming services you want for the price of five, right? And so they would give you an option to sort of like pick five or six things. And instead of paying their retail price for all of them, there might be some sort of slightly discounted rate if you buy a a bundle. And that's basically what we had with cable. So audiences have started going to theaters again since the pandemic to see the big blockbusters like the latest Marvel movies and the Top Gun sequel, but sales are still below pre-pandemic levels. Can theaters survive the era that we are in today? I think this is a supply-demand thing. I think some theaters will survive because there's like something about you go out with your friends or your family You get an escape when you go to the theater for the two to three hours and you watch a movie and it's still cheaper than like going to a live sporting event or a lot of other things you might take your family to do for two or three hours. So I still think there's a place for theaters, but we may just have an oversupply of some theaters, just like we had an oversupply or have an oversupply of retail square footage in the U.S. So you still have pricey real estate on Fifth Avenue in New York. Costco is still doing really well. Target's still doing really well. But some retailers and a lot of them in the past couple of years have gone out of business because 
there just isn't enough demand for them. And so I could see that happening to theaters as well, but I think there's always going to be some sort of allocation. There may be a decrease, but I don't think it'll be an extinction. So how do you think the state of the economy and high inflation that we're dealing with right now do impact the entertainment industry, such as TV and movie production? Do you think the economy affects the content that we, the end users, will actually see? So there might be a little bit of a delayed reaction because, you know, studio execs, department heads for all the major companies, I'm not speaking about anyone in particular, but just generally speaking, they form budgets and their budget for 23 is going to be tied to the revenue they think they're going to make and what they made in 22. And so if they forecast growth and growth in terms of ads, growth in terms of subscribers, growth in terms of box office, they'll spend more. They can hire more people. They can greenlight more shows. They can spend more on those shows. But if they're forecasting uh, things that are going to stay flat or decline, they're going to be tightening the purse strings a little bit. 2022 budgets were made last year when it was all about growth, but they can't really revise their budgets mid-year. They can make decisions on um, shrinking projects or cutting out particular scenes, but generally speaking, like the major impacts are going to be in next year's budget. And what does that look like? Just fewer big blockbusters, like spending less on the actual production? So the blockbusters that has an established fan base where you're already in development on the script, you have the actors, you sort of greenlit it and you scheduled it for next year. I think that's still got to go. If you're Marvel or Universal, the blockbusters, I think, are critical to success. I think the things that are going to get delayed are maybe the more experimental art pieces, things that are in development, but not fully greenlit. There's fewer dollars to go around. You know, the art department has to get done more with less. The location department has to get done more with less. They have to accomplish basically what they set out to do, but the cost of everything has gone up. And so there's really no more money. So they might have to cut a certain scene, right? Because it may not really be that impactful to the story, but they're still going to deliver a movie. Final takeaway, final thought about the state of the entertainment industry. I think things are evolving so rapidly You and I, we probably don't wear headsets every day, Oculus headsets, but I do think that's the next phase of this. The way that we interact with content is going to change because I I think we'll be, it'll be more immersive and more 3D. And I think we'll literally be in interconnected virtual worlds, watching our favorite shows, interacting with our favorite characters. I'm optimistic. Well, thanks to our guests for sharing their expertise with us today. Be sure to give Jordan Miner a follow on Twitter and read his reviews and opinions on PCMag.com. And check out Paul Sarker's podcast, Better Call Paul. We have links in our episode notes. And that'll do it for us today. Be sure to tune in to our regular 10-minute news roundups available every weekday morning starting at 4 a.m. We'll be back on Monday. Until then, have a great weekend. (laughs) 